You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eurythmy as Visible Speech, Collected Works, Volume 279, translated by Vera and Judy Compton Burnett. This is Lecture 15 of 15 Lectures. There will be some addenda in addition, but uh, this is the last lecture of the cycle. Entitled, In Eurythmy, the entire body must become soul. Today we must bring this course of lectures to its conclusion. It has naturally only been possible to give certain guiding lines. Much still remains unsaid and must be reserved for a future occasion. It seemed to me better to develop these guiding lines in a really fundamental way, out of the nature of Eurythmy itself, rather than to attempt a more encyclopedic survey of the whole domain of Eurythmy. It is of the greatest importance that each individual Eurythmist should strengthen this power of creating the movements out of an inner activity, for it is in this way alone that a true understanding for Eurythmy can be developed. I shall deal first, my attention having been drawn to the matter, with the two sounds G and V, and in the German that's a W. Readers aside, there was a confusion a few lectures back about the V. They showed a V, and I was wondering if it was the Fa, Fa sound, which is what a V sounds like in German. I realize now they're showing V for the W sound in German, V, and I apologize for that slight confusion back there. End of readers aside. Let us first take the G, G. In modern languages, in modern European languages at least, this sound has not the same significance as it had in earlier times. For this reason we have not considered it until now. The sound G, when properly formed, signifies an inner strengthening of the self, a strengthening of the soul forces, a concentrating in itself of everything in the human being which naturally spreads outward. It is therefore the sound of speech which, so to speak, holds our being together, insofar as the latter is a vessel for natural forces. This is the sound G. Perhaps Fräulein V will make the movement for G in order that you may see how well the character of this gesture is adapted to show this inner strengthening and concentration. The warding off of everything external and the welding together of everything inward is expressed in the gesture for G. Now we come to the remarkable sound V, V, or in German the W. We find this sound less frequently in the more ancient languages, in the oriental languages, that is to say. It expresses a special need of the human soul. It is as if the human soul were not used to the shelter of a firmly built structure, but felt compelled to wander. Instead of the firmly built house, which may be experienced in the B sound, instead of this solid house, the soul feels the need of a tent, or of the shelter of the woods. In the V sound, there lies the feeling of what may be described as a moving shelter. This is why one always feels, with the sound V, V, that one is, as it were, carrying a shelter which is constantly being set up anew. Everything of a wandering nature, where the essential element is movement, must be experienced in this sound. It is the surging of the waves which is expressed by a strongly formed V. When delicately formed, it expresses the sparkling of the waters. This will help you to realize what must be felt in the sound V. Now it is a remarkable fact that when using the sound V, German W, one quite naturally finds oneself repeating it. One feels compelled to repeat it several times in succession. Something seems amiss if one simply says es valet. One wishes to say es valet und woget, es weht und windet, es wirkt und webt, and so on. There is in short no sound which leads so naturally 
into the sphere of alliteration, as this sound v. An alliteration can be made up with other sounds, but in no other way will it come about so naturally. Perhaps Fräulein S. will demonstrate the sound v. You see how it demands a gesture filled with movement? V may thus be said to be that sound which permeates being with movement. Will you now show us, just going round in a circle without actually showing the structure of the alliteration, we shall add this shortly, an alliteration built up on the sound V. In this example there are also other alliterated sounds, but observe how slight an impression they make when compared to one built up on the V sound. Thus we have Wehe nun, Wald and der Gott, Wege schick naht, ich walte der Sommer und Winter, sechzig außer Landes, wo man mich immer schaute. Now comes the other alliteration. In die Schar der Schützen, doch der keine Burg, man den Tod mir brachte. Then we have a very marked alliteration built upon M. You will feel this strongly, yet not so strongly as in the case of V. Nun soll mein eigenes Kind mich mit dem Schwerte hauen, morden mich mit der Mortaxt, oder soll ich zum Mörder werden. One cannot help feeling that every alliteration based upon the V sound appears to come about quite as a matter of course, whereas all other alliterations, no matter what sound is repeated, have the effect of being drawn out from the V. Alliteration is an essential and fundamental element in poetry, especially where the sound V is experienced in a living way. In this connection, we must develop a twofold feeling. In the first place, there lies in the nature of alliteration, that is to say, when the first letter of certain words is repeated, something which takes us back into earlier stages of European culture. Wilhelm Jordan had attempted to revive alliteration and has indeed succeeded in introducing it into his work with a certain strength and conviction. In modern German, this element of alliteration appears somewhat out of place. A feeling for it, however, can always be recaptured if one has the gift of going back in imagination to an earlier epoch. The short poem which I have read to you is taken from the Song of Hildebrandt. Hildebrandt was long absent from his native country, and on his return journey he met his son Hadubrandt, with whom he came into conflict. It is the battle between these two which is related in this alliterative form, a form which was at that time an instinctive and completely natural means of expression. An alliteration may be shown in the following way. Let a number of eurythmists form a circle, and now, because the very essence of alliteration is consonantal, although not invariably based upon the V sound, they must emphasize the alliterated consonants by stepping round this circle. The vowel sounds do not form part of the alliteration. For this reason, they may be shown by another group of eurythmists who stand inside the circle, making the movements for the vowels. I will ask several of you to show the alliteration in the poem I have just read. Will you take your places in the circle? And now three others must stand in the center and show the vowels. The alliteration will be particularly strongly emphasized if whenever a new alliterated sound occurs, it is shown by a different eurythmist, the preceding eurythmist at the same time repeating the previous sound. Only those vowels which follow directly after the alliterated consonant should be shown by those in the outer circle. The other vowel sounds must be done more as an accompaniment by those standing in the center. In order to make the whole thing quite clear, let us take this example and do it quite slowly, those in the outer circle moving in the alliteration. Wehe nun, Wald ender Gott, Wehgeschick, excuse me, Wehgeschick naht, Ich walte, der Sommer und Winter, Sechzig außer Landes, Wo man mich scharte, Wie die Schar der Schützen, 
doch vor keine Burg, man den Tod mir brachte, nun soll mein eigenes Kind mit mich mit dem Schwerte hauen, morden mich mit der Mordtaxt, oder soll ich zum Mörder werden? Readers aside, uh, I'm unclear on how to pronounce this word, M-O-R-D-A-X-T in German. And it reads aside. The alliterated consonant and the vowel sound immediately following it must be carried round the circle from one eurythmist to the next. This will show you how, in fact, movement, and also restraint, may be brought into such a poem sheerly by means of alliteration. We will now pass on to something else, something which will help us to make of the human organism a fitting instrument for the service of eurythmy. In this connection it is very necessary to gain an understanding of the difference in eurythmy between walking and standing. Standing still always signifies that one is the image, the picture of something. Walking, on the other hand, signifies that one's self will actually be something. When working out a poem in eurythmy, you must be able to feel whether, at a certain point, it is a question of describing or indicating something or of representing the actual nature of something in a living way. It is according to this that one must decide whether to stand still, a lessening of the movement tends already in this direction, or whether to pass over into movement. We shall find that we have less occasion to stand still than to move, for there lies in the very nature of poetry the tendency to express something living, something which is, not merely that which signifies something. Here it is well that we should know how the human body is related to the whole cosmos. The feet of man correspond to the earth, for in their very structure they are suited to the earth, where we have to do with gravity, with the weight of the earth, and this feeling of the weight of the earth is present in nearly all forms of human suffering, we must endeavor to express this in eurythmy by a graceful use of the feet and legs. The hands and arms reveal the life of the soul. This soul element is the most essential part of what may be brought to expression in eurythmy, and this is why in eurythmy the movements of the arms and hands play such an important part. Here already we pass over into the realm of the spiritual. For it is in the transition from one sound to the next that we find the best means of expressing that which is spiritual. In language, the spiritual element finds expression in the mood of irony, for instance, or roguishness, in everything that is to say which emanates from the human spirit. German aus dem menschlichen Spiritus, from man himself, in that he is a spiritual being, gifted with intelligence in the best sense of the word. Such things must be indicated by means of the head, for the head is the instrument of the spirit. We must become conscious of such things, then we shall be able to express them in the right way. It is especially important to be able to use the head in the most varied manner, according to the possibilities of its organization. Fräulein S., will you turn your head toward the right? The turning of the head toward the right may always be taken to signify, I will. Naturally, I do not mean these two words merely, but everything which contains the feeling, I will. On the other hand, when you turn your head toward the left, it signifies, I feel. Thus everything in a poem, where the mood of I feel is dominant, we must turn the head toward the left. Now, bend the head toward the right. This bending movement of the head forward toward the right signifies I will not. Bend it in the same way toward the left and it signifies I do not feel this. I do not understand it or realize it. And now, bend the head forward, straight forward. You will see how natural this movement is if you do the following. Fräulein S.C.H., will you stand facing Fräulein S., excuse me, Frau S.C.H., will you stand facing Fräulein S. in profile and do these movements. 
We suppose that we must suppose that Frau S.C.H. says it is the gods who inspire the human heart with willing service. Fräulein S. gives a eurythmic answer. You are too clever for me. I do not understand you. She knows this by means of the aforesaid gesture carried out clearly and definitely. You will find numberless opportunities of applying this movement. It signifies a sinking into oneself when faced with something which one is not able to understand. Then, further, so that we may have at least one example, I must point out that the twelve gestures related to the zodiac and the seven gestures related to the moving planetary circle may be made use of in a variety of ways. By depart, for instance, from what was said yesterday with regard to rhyming, we must learn to understand such an exercise as the following. Fräulein S. and Fräulein B., will you demonstrate what I am now going to describe? Fräulein S., will you make the gesture for Leo, and you, Fräulein B., the gesture for Aquarius? Now, as I read this little poem, try to show it in your rhythm. In the case of the emphasized rhymes, the rhymes which fall on an accented beat, you, Fräulein S., must make the gesture of Leo. With the unemphasized rhymes, thus those which do not fall on the accented but on the unaccented beat, you, Fräulein B., must make the gesture of Aquarius. Make the movements standing still, choosing perhaps the vowel sounds, and only making the zodiacal gestures at the end of the lines so that we may really see their effect when they follow immediately after the rhyme. Es rauscht das Bechlein über Gestein. You, Fräulein B., must hold the sound. Ein Weidenbaum drüber gebogen, drauf sitzt des Müllers Büblein klein, im Schosse ein kleines Zitterlein, die Hüschen bespült von den Wogen. Es kommt ein Mann des Wegs zu gehen, er bleibt so still, so schweigsam stehen, sieht zu dem sinnigen Knaben, hat auch ein Büblein klein, war auch so still und auch so fein, das liegt nun draußen begraben. You see how the rhyme may be emphasized in this way by means of the zodiacal gestures. I am drawing your attention to such things so that you may be able to work out similar exercises for yourselves, thus gaining assurance and certainty in the development of eurythmic gestures. I will now ask a number of eurythmists to come forward and make various movements as I explain them. Number one must place the feet together, stretching the arms out so that they lie in a horizontal direction, on a level with the shoulders. Number two must stand with the feet slightly apart, holding out the arms in such a way that the hands about correspond with the level of the larynx. Now, for number three, stand with your feet somewhat farther, further apart and hold the arms in such a way that if a line were drawn from hand to hand, it would pass just below the heart. Number four, stand with feet still further apart, quite wide, holding the arms right up above the head. The hands must be held in such a way that they could be connected with the feet by means of a straight line. Number five, stand with the feet in a similar position to number three, and now hold the arms in such a way that a line drawn from hand to hand would pass at the level of the top of the head. Here, in the case of number two, the line passes across the larynx. Here, number one, the line is quite horizontal. Here, number four, it is high up above the head. And here, number five, it is just at head level. Continue to hold all these gestures. Number six, you must stand with legs close together, with the arms held upward in an absolute vertical line. To these gestures, we must add the following words. Number one, ich denke die Rede. Number two, ich rede. Number three, ich habe geredet. Number four, ich suche mich im Geiste. Parentheses, meinen geistigen Ursprung. 
Number five, ich fühle mich in mir. Number six, ich bin auf dem geistigen Wege. Or, ich bin auf dem Weg zum Geister zu mir. English, I think speech. I speak. I have spoken. I seek for myself in the spirit, my spiritual origin. I feel myself within myself. I am on the spiritual path. I am on the way to the spirit, to myself. Approximately in this way, and now you must try to pass from one position to the next. For thine be, will you do this? Place yourself in front of each one in turn, and as you take up each position, you must feel impelled to express the words that are said by means of the gesture being carried out by the eurythmist standing behind you. As number one, you have to begin. Ich denke die Rede. Passing on, take up your place in front of number two. Ich rede. Ich habe geredet. Ich suche mich im Geiste. Ich fühle mich im mir. Ich bin auf dem Geistwege. In this way we get the whole series of gestures. Ich denke die Rede. Ich rede. Ich habe geredet. Ich suche mich im Geiste. Ich fühle mich in mir. Ich bin auf dem Wege zum Geiste zu mir. If when teaching Eurythmy to adults a beginning is made with this very exercise, it will certainly help them to find their way into Eurythmy easily and well. These gestures, when carried out in this way, one after the other, form an exercise which may be classed among those having a, an harmonizing and curative effect. Thus, when anyone is so disturbed in his soul life that this disturbance works itself out into his physical body, manifesting itself in all sorts of digestive troubles, then this exercise, taken in such a case as a curative exercise, may always be given with the greatest benefit. And finally, my dear friends, I must once again impress upon your hearts the fact that really good eurythmy can only be achieved when there is the determination always to make a thorough and careful preparatory analysis of anything which is to be interpreted by means of eurythmy. Every poem must be studied in the first place with a view to discovering which are the most fundamental sounds. If a poem expressing the feeling of wonder, the wonder experienced by the poet, we find many ah sounds, then we may be quite sure that this poem is well suited to you with me, for it is the sound ah which expresses wonder. The poet himself has felt that ah is specially related to the mood of wonder, and the rhythmist will be able to intensify the effect by laying stress on the movement corresponding to the sound ah. In eurythmy it is even more important to concentrate on the sounds contained in a poem than on the actual sense content of the words, for the sense content is the prose element. The more a poem depends upon its sense content, so much the less is it a poem. And the more the sound content is brought out, the more a poem is dependent on sound, the nearer it approaches to true poetry. As a rhythmist, then, one should not take one's start from the prose content, but should enter so deeply into the nature of the sounds as to be able to say, when many ah sounds occur in a poem, it is obvious that it is a poem based upon the mood of wonder and must be so expressed. This shows us the attitude we must have toward language as such. Further, we must seek in poetry for those characteristics of language which we have already mentioned here. What is concrete, for instance, what abstract, and other details of this kind. This means that one must first enter into the nature of a poem and study it according to the structure and formation of its language, only later trying to express it in Eurythmy. In Eurythmy there is still another thing to bear in mind, and that is the way in which, in the Eurythmy figures, I have tried to portray movement, feeling, and character. This is another field of study for Eurythmists. The movement must be felt as movement, and is depicted as such in the figures. 
as a Eurythmist one lives in movement. We must, however, more especially when a veil is floating around us, but also when we are not actually wearing one, picture this veil as expressing the aura. It is only when one bears this in mind that one can bring the necessary grace and beauty into the movements. Let us look at the Eurythmy figure for L. The L sound itself lies in the movement, but that which can be added to the L as feeling is shown by the fact that here, in the region of the arms, the aura is quite wide, becoming narrower as it hangs down. You must imagine that your arms reveal your feeling by means of the floating aura of the veil. The dress, which here appears somewhat wider at the bottom, must be studied in a similar way. This is how one must picture oneself. As a Eurythmist, one should always feel oneself attired in dress, and floating veil, as I have indicated here in the figure. Character also is of the greatest importance. When stretching out the arms, one should actually feel that here the muscles are stretched and taut. Everywhere where character is indicated by means of its corresponding color, there must be a tension of the muscles. This must also be shown by the Eurythmist. And here again, for example, you must use the legs in such a way that you really experience this muscular tension. The Eurythmy figures are intended to show such things and have them designed accordingly. When you have in this way made a study of each separate sound, your whole organism will be so sensitive to sound that you will feel... This whole poem is built up upon the mood of L, let us say, or upon the mood of B, and it will then be possible for you to create your interpretation of a poem out of the sounds themselves. All these things must be very carefully borne in mind when it is a question of teaching eurythmy. In educational eurythmy, it is naturally important to introduce such movements of the body as can work with moral benefit upon the soul life and serve to further the development of intellect and feeling. In artistic eurythmy, the essential thing is that the soul should gain the power of working through the medium of the body. Thus the movements of eurythmy, these gestures as they are shaped and formed, must be felt to be absolutely natural, indeed inevitable. One must feel that they could not be otherwise, that it is only by means of these very gestures that certain moods or artistic concepts can be expressed. Yet another thing must be borne in mind, and that is the fact that the learning of Eurythmy entails an actual transformation of the human organism. Any performance which reveals the slightest trace of struggle between body and soul must be looked upon as unfinished and imperfect. In a Eurythmy performance, the whole body must have become soul. A program is sometimes given, as you yourselves know, which has been prepared with unbelievable industry and is then shown for the first time. One can enjoy such a program where everything is fresh and spontaneous, where there is still a struggle with the form running and where, on occasion, the arms are not moved but thrown about, appearing so heavy as to be liable at any moment to fall to the ground. There is spontaneity in all this, and it gives us a certain pleasure. Then the time comes when the program is taken on tour and given perhaps in some two dozen towns. As a matter of fact, I believe this has never actually happened, but it might well happen. The program is, as I said, performed in about two dozen towns, and the Eurythmists return. Then, because Frau Dr. Steiner has had no time to prepare a new program, This old program, which we saw some six weeks ago, in all its youthful spontaneity, is presented again. Now the pleasure is of a very different kind. Everything has become easy and fluent. One notices notices too that the Eurythmists, because they have visited new towns and learned to know fresh conditions, are stimulated by the outer world and have gained a certain inner enthusiasm. All this has had its effect on the movements, and they have become effortless and free. 
The performance is now sheer delight. And one can only exclaim, Oh, if this program could be performed fifty times more, how beautiful it would be then. We must have an understanding for these things. Every artist whose work is bound up with the stage knows the truth of what I have just said. A good actor would never think that he has mastered a a role before he had played it some fifty times. With the fifty-first performance, he might perhaps think that he could play the part, for then everything would have become second nature. We too must acquire this attitude of mind, my dear friends. We must develop such a love for anything which is to be shown in a performance that we simply cannot put it aside. Indeed, no one but the onlooker may be permitted to find an often repeated item dull or tedious. It is in the sphere of art above all that it is important to realize this. One must come back to a thing again and again. In a place where I once happened to be staying, I had the opportunity of seeing a play repeated fifty times. I went every evening to see the same play and allowed it to work upon me. By the fifth evening, I did perhaps have a certain feeling of boredom. But by the fifty-first evening, I was not in the least bored, even though the performance in a small provincial theatre was very mediocre, so much could be learned from its very imperfection that this experience, peculiar though it was, could be of lifelong benefit. As a matter of fact, I did not like the play in question. As a play, it did not interest me at all. It was Sudermann's Era. I could not stand the play. Nevertheless, I saw it performed fifty times by a somewhat mediocre cast. My aim was to enter into all the details unconsciously, thus experiencing it purely with the astral body. I wished to take it right out of the realm of conscious perception and simply to live with it. People must learn. And now, when I am speaking about eurythmy, I will take the opportunity of mentioning it. People must learn the value of rhythm, even in more complicated matters. We say the Lord's Prayer not fifty times only, but countless times, and we never find it tedious. Notice is seldom paid to the fact that such things are connected with experiences of the human organism, experiences which are apparently more or less immaterial and to which our karma leads us at one time or another. With this, my dear friends, we must bring this course of lectures to a close. From the way I have developed the subject, you will have realized that my first aim has been to show you that it is out of the feelings, out of the soul life, that eurythmy must proceed. Eurythmic technique must be one out of a love for eurythmy, for in truth everything must proceed out of love. How much I myself love you, Ridmi, my dear friends, I have told you recently in the news sheet. I said then how earnestly I wish that the great devotion demanded of all those actively engaged in the work of Eurythmy, work which was begun by Frau Dr. Steiner, begun by our Eurythmy artists here in Dornach, and which has gradually won wider recognition and esteem, how earnestly I wish that all this may be rightly appreciated for it cannot be too highly prized in anthroposophical circles. It is my hope that this course of lectures may have contributed something toward the furtherance of Eurythmy in this respect, in that all of us who are gathered together here, whether as Eurythmists, who already know the fundamentals of Eurythmy, as beginners, or indeed as those really interested in Eurythmy, that all of us here will feel ourselves as the helpers and promoters of Eurythmy, of this art which springs from no humble source, but has as its lofty origin that cosmic knowledge which creates from out of the spirit. If we feel ourselves as the helpers of Eurythmy, either in an active or in a more passive sense, then Eurythmy will be able to fulfill the mission which it can and should fulfill in the general development of anthroposophy. When people will see in beauty the spirit working in human movement, then this will make some contribution to the whole attitude which humanity, through anthroposophy, should take up toward the spirit. Let us think of all the many things which have grown up out of anthroposophical soil, forming together one great whole. 
and then inspired by the anthroposophy in our hearts. Let us build up and develop each separate activity as it should and will be developed if we prove ourselves worthy of the real aims of anthroposophy. This course of Eurythmy lectures may perhaps have done something toward this end. That is the end of lecture 15 of the book, the end of the lecture cycle, Eurythmy as Visible Speech. Uh, I will be including a number of uh, uh, small introductions by Steiner and, and various other addenda at, at, uh, for another 40 pages or so of this book, but the cycle itself is now over.